been, you? Yeah, I'm good. It's been a big 24 hours for us here at the show. Sadly, this is our second last edition of Wake Up. It is, and we've been overwhelmed by all of your messages of support. Thank you so much. And we have adored every minute of making this show for all of you wonderful people at home. Yeah, but buckle up, Spanky, because we're going out with a bang. <laughs> Australia, it's time to wake up. 20 children injured after a nighttime bus crash northeast of Perth. They're in hospital this morning and will have an update on their condition. Also ahead, a former Channel 7 makeup artist, the latest to give evidence against Rolf Harris in court. We're going to take you live to London to find out exactly what she had to say. Plus, we find out more about this incredible box that could radically increase the number of heart transplant patients. It's an amazing medical breakthrough. Then Seth MacFarlane and Charlize Theron sit down with our own Maud Garrett to talk about their new comedy that goes wild, wild west. And get ready, folks, one of the biggest selling bands of all time. The Eagles are coming to town. We're putting the pink champagne on ice this Thursday, the 22nd of May, 2014. From coast to coast, this is Wake Up On 10. Now, from our Manly Beach HQ, Natasha Belling and James Matheson. Good morning. Thank you so much for your company this Thursday morning. It is Thursday, isn't it? It's been a big week. <laughs> it sure has, but um, we're going to guide you through the next Who's couple spanky? of hours. spanky? What do you mean? You said spanky. I didn't get that. I don't know time. what you're talking about, but that <laughs> extraordinary story about uh, the heart in a box which uh, we can all sort of relate to. Time to get to your news headlines right now. Nula is standing by in Federation Square and I have it on good authority that she's feeling a little bit under, we under the weather. Is that right, Nula? Oh, a couple of sherbets you last night, Nula. You, seriously, James, you have got to stop eavesdropping on private <laughs> conversation. I don't know what you're talking about. And for the record, I'd like to be spanky. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You play your cards you right go. and anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> Right, on a serious note, some of our staff and crew didn't get here today because there is this massive situation developing on the Monash Freeway today, and that's where we start the news. Um, yeah, unfolding on the Monash Freeway here in Melbourne, a 35-year-old man's been arrested after a brief standoff with police. For the latest details, we're joined now by Charnel Vella in Melbourne. Charnel, what more can you tell us? Well, good morning, Nula. This all unfolded just before 5am on the Monash Freeway, which is a major arterial here in Melbourne's southeast. We understand a prime mover was spotted driving erratically on the wrong side of that freeway and the police and the bomb squad were then called in. Now, witnesses have said that a short standoff then occurred between the driver and the police and they were told to get out of their cars and move way back to an exclusion zone. Now, it remains unclear what is on that truck, but it is clear that the Monash Freeway will remain shut down for several hours. Nola. Yeah, that is going to make it very difficult for many people to get into work and school today. All the best with that. Thanks, Chanel. Now, 24 people, including 21 children, have been taken to hospital after a school bus crash in Perth. The 26-seater, carrying mostly Malaysian nationals, ran off the road into a gully just before 8 last night in Gijiganup, northeast of the city. Police say no one's critical, however, a number of passengers suffered broken bones and internal injuries. The stretch of road is notoriously dangerous, with two small children killed in a head-on collision last July. An Australian makeup artist has alleged that Rolf Harris felt up her shorts two dozen times while they were working on a television shoot. For more on this story, Ben Lewis joins us live now from London. Ben, what else has the court heard today? Nola, good morning. The woman said she was 24 years old in 1986 when she was hired by Channel 7 to do the makeup for Rolf Harris, who was filming a series of television promotions at the time. She said she was in a small makeup room. He was in the makeup chair when he allegedly slid his leg up, uh, arm up her leg and felt up inside her denim shorts. She said she was shocked and as she told the court, my first thought was, oh my God, I can't believe he works with children. She explained to the jury that he allegedly 
allegedly indecently assaulted her another two dozen times during that eight hour shoot and she overheard him making lewd comments about her body with the show's director on the way out of court. She, uh, she was quite defiant. She snubbed him as she walked past the box and slammed the door as she left the courtroom. Mr Harris has denied any wrongdoing. He doesn't face any charges in relation to these claims as the alleged offences took place outside of the United Kingdom. Nula. Thanks, Ben. Ben Lewis there in London. Two people have been charged after protests in the Sydney CBD. A crowd of around 800 people participated in the march, which started at the University of Technology, Sydney. Students and staff were angry over the government's planned changes to university fees. A 23-year-old man allegedly used a flare while another man's accused of assaulting police. Both will appear in court tomorrow. The body of a Sydney University international student has been found in New Zealand after she was washed away while walking the Milford Track on the country's South Island. The 22-year-old was swept into the Clinton River on Monday. The body of Jessica Asman from Jakarta was found during a break in bad weather late yesterday afternoon. And a student has gone on a stabbing spree in Taiwan, leaving four people dead and at least another 21 injured. Witnesses say the 21-year-old stabbed anyone he could see on the carriage and that the attack seemed random. Police quickly made an arrest and are preparing to charge the man with murder. The incident occurred just as the afternoon rush hour began. To sport now and some injury woes for Queensland ahead of Origin Game 1 with Justin Hodges battling an ankle complaint. Meantime, blue skipper Paul Gallen has initiated a booze-free bonding night in Coffs Harbour where the team is in training camp. And great news for injured knight Alex McKinnon, the Newcastle forward has revealed he's getting feeling back in his legs eight weeks after injuring his spine. That's great news. West Coast flyer Nick Natanui says it was a no-brainer to re-sign at the Eagles. The Ruckman ended speculation, inking a new five-year deal worth a reported four mil. Meantime, Richmond's Jack Rewald has admitted the Tigers' attempt to copy Hawthorne's game style has backfired. And Mila Jednak has been named Socceroos skipper for the World Cup, but he may sit out Monday's clash against South Africa. Fielder is in doubt with a groin injury, meaning vice captains Tim Cahill or Mark Bresciano could be given the armband. Yednyak becomes the fourth player to captain Australia at a World Cup. Now, Melbourne's record breaking warm spell will be ended with late showers today. Here's what's happening where you are. A mostly sunny day ahead for Greater Brisbane. It's switched 25, 24 in Redcliffe, and 25 on the Gold Coast. A few showers and 28 for Cairns, Townsville 28 with showers, 26 in Bundaberg with a shower or two expected, and Brisbane can expect a shower or two and a top of 25. Sydney 26 and sunny, Melbourne a few late showers 23, 19 with rain increasing in Hobart. And guys, we're going out with a bang, and that means it's going to be animal mania for the next oh, two days. Pandas. Today, well, today I'm going to start with a goat, Tash. Oh. <laughs> Frosty was taken to an animal shelter in Melbourne, suffering from joint navel ill, which means he can't use his back legs. So he was given a wheelchair to help move around so he can flush out the toxins Aww. from his body. Look at him. Aww. He's the reason why I think I will become a vegetarian. <laughs> Right, like you, how could you eat that? <laughs> he's so cute. I love you, Frosty. Oh, he is there, beautiful. That's, that's the first animal story so far. Prepare for many more. So Excellent you start <laughs> with goats and then you work your way up. Is that the right? To pandas. Plan? Yeah, to a panda. Finale. <laughs> so what time did you go to bed last night, Norm? <laughs> James, I don't want to discuss this. Seriously, you, you are the worst eavesdropper I've ever met. Purely for work purposes, Nola. Mm. <laughs> research. Okay, well, uh, we'll research again in about 20 minutes' time. Talk to you then. See you then. <laughs> You're on. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nulls. Now, let's take a quick look at what's making news on this morning's front pages. And we start with The Australian, which reveals subsidies for renewable energy schemes like rooftop solar panels and wind farms will cost electricity customers and consumers up to $21.6 billion by 2020. The Herald Sun, meantime, has the fallout from yesterday's nationwide uni protests on its front page. The Daily Telegraph now, which reveals the number of New South Wales disability support pensioners outnumbered. Australia's war wounded by more than one in 44,000. The Courier Mail has Queensland State Labor MP Joanne Miller on its front page. 
after she was compared after she compared fly in fly out mine workers earning six figure salaries to victims of the Holocaust. The Age reports the poorest 20% of Australian families will pay $1.1 billion more into government coffers than the richest households as a result of the budget. While well, the Sydney Morning Herald quotes the Vice Chancellor of Sydney University who says children of middle class Australian families risk being priced out of a tertiary education because of the federal government's uni reforms. A horror crash is the headline news on the front page of the West Australian after a busload of children all believed to be visiting Malaysian and Indonesian students and three adults were rushed to hospital after their bus crashed east of Perth last night. Adelaide's advertiser reports a Royal Commission may be asked to investigate claims officials in Upper House President Russell Wortley's former union took kickbacks to secure workers' redundancy pay. Hobart's Mercury, meantime, the global search is on to find world-class tourism experiences to help boost visitor numbers to the Apple Isle. And finally, a great story on the front page of the NT News today. Punters reckon Darwin is the most unlikely city in Australia to start fining people for letting their pants hang too low below the waist. It follows a decision by a council in the US to fine low riders $25. But sports bet users believe Darwin is the least likely Aussie city to adopt a similar policy. Oh. Sports bet has bet <laughs> yes. that Darwin is the least likely city yes. to find young men for having saggy pants. These are the big issues. Absolutely. They've done it again, the NT News. Let's see what's hot on the web now, though. Alison Stevenson is at news.com.au. Ali, good morning. What are people looking at today? Good morning, guys. Look, I've got another big issue for you here. It's the age-old debate that has divided denim aficionados. But now, the head honcho at Levi's has declared once and for all how often you should actually wash your jeans. And the answer is never. Now, the Le Levi CEO, um, Chip Berg, says, although it sounds disgusting, you shouldn't ever throw your 501s in the washing machine, but rather use a sponge or a toothbrush on any spots because it's a better oh. way to maintain the integrity of of the denim. Now he made these comments on the 141st birthday of the classic Levi's 501 jean in a pair that he himself hadn't washed for over a year. But he did concede that if they're a little bit on the nose, you can actually put them in a freezer to freshen them up. So the freezer wash, whoever heard of that? Apparently I've been thing. talking about We're, this on television this for a little disgusting. while. Disgusting. I'm sorry. I How know. often do you wash your jeans? No, that's what I'm saying. You don't ever wash them? Well, you put them in the freezer. It gets rid of the smell. It's what like, else do you wash these? in the freezer, James? <laughs> these, are, these are like $200 oh. jeans. I think the issue is more that you don't have socks on. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's not draw attention to that. But, you know, it's what they do. And it actually keeps them nice and shapely. Yeah. It's true. <sighs> Ali, thanks Thank for the you. update. Thanks so much, guys. Still to come this morning in a packed show, the hidden toxins in our food and our homes. Also, the new medical technology allowing a heart to keep beating outside the body during transplants. And while students protest all over the country, it's been revealed that Frances Abbott, the Prime Minister's daughter, received her tertiary schooling for free. Right, up next we're going to cross to the Cancer Council's launch of Australia's biggest morning tea. Share a cuppa and save a life when we come back. Thanks to Inner Health Plus. Have you read your Inner Health Plus today? Wake up, we'll be back in a tick. You're watching Wake Up, great to have your company this morning all across the country. Well, it is a truly sad statistic, but cancer now touches one in every two Australians. We all know friends, loved ones or colleagues who have been diagnosed and beaten cancers, cancer and others who haven't been as fortunate, and some who are still fighting their own battles. Another awful statistic is that around 128,000 Australians are diagnosed with some form of cancer every single year. With us this morning to talk through these stats and what we're doing about it is Network 10's Barry Dubois, who lives with cancer after being diagnosed in 2010 with the disease, a, a, a type of cancer that, I guess, attacks the immune system and healthy bone marrow. Barry, how are you? Thanks for joining us this morning. Oh, it's great to be here, James. Tash, how are you? Very <laughs> yeah, well, we're thank good. you. I mean, we spoke about some of those statistics there. How important is fundraising to try and address those exact statistics? 
well, those exact statistics are why I am here. I mean, at one stage of your life, someone is going to say to you or you're going to hear the words, I've got cancer. I can tell you firsthand from both of those uh, situations, a pretty hard thing to do. I lost my mum in 2004 and then about 18 months later, my wife got cervical cancer. So it's a very tough, tough subject for me. But I can say this, when you hear those words, particularly from someone else, you say to them straight away, we'll do everything we can to beat this, don't worry about it. And then straight after that, you say to yourself in the back of your mind, what the hell are we gonna do? I've got no control of this whatever, whatsoever. And so that's why I'm so passionate about the Cancer Council because the Cancer Council does that. It raises funds for research for cancer, for social work, for support, all those sorts of things. So when you're wondering what you can do, this is what you can do. It's all about the morning tea. With me today, I've got Professor Olver. He's the head of the Cancer Council and he's going to tell us a little bit more about where the money that we raise today goes. Well, the money goes for cancer research, Barry, and, and we spend about 50 million a year. Uh, you know, Australia have had some great successes. Everyone knows about Ian Fraser's cancer of the cervix vaccine, but there's a whole lot of new targeted therapies coming to treat cancer uh, that are already proving successful. It, it, it's, it's a great cause to be a part of. We're out here by the harbour. We got here about six o'clock in the morning. We're with the Pulse Running Group. And Christine from the Pulse Running Group is, a, uh, is going through treatment at the moment for breast cancer. Tell me today why it's so important for you, Christine. Well, I wouldn't think a year ago that I'd be standing here. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in November last year and fundraising over the past 10 years has improved my chances and other people's chances of survival rates. And to be a part of today, you've got all your friends here from the running group. We're, we're all as keen as mustard. It, it, it makes you feel better inside, doesn't it, just to be a part of this and know that the people are doing this for us. It does. It's not just about the person with cancer. We forget the, I guess, the quiet, silent victims is our friends and families who support us in the background. And Cancer Council provides valuable information and support for those people as well. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Christine. Guys, I mean, it's as simple as that. Uh, all you've got to do is, is give what you can, get involved where you can, raise some money for the Cancer Council. And today we're going to save a life. It's as simple as that. Barry, just quickly, often when we donate, we don't know where the money goes. Goes. Just tell us yet again about the extraordinary research work that, uh, you know, the Cancer Council does, making a real difference to survivors and also research into cancer. As Professor Oliver just said, I mean, we've had some great stories just recently about the vaccine for cervical cancer. I mean, cervical cancer now, uh, Professor, just explain where the, where the money is going and how we're really gaining from this research. Well, we fund researchers to do research into things like new drugs. Now, we've had the story of a new melanoma drug and Ron Walker, uh, and that's an exciting drug, a drug called a PD-1 inhibitor and it allows the body's own immune system to attack the tumour by getting rid of the blockages. Well that's a very clever way and, and for Ron Walker it's worked very well and over time it'll be available to all the other people with melanoma and that's what we're trying to achieve here. And, and as well as that, as Christine just said, when people are diagnosed with cancer, particularly in regional Australia, they need help to get to their, to their treatments, to get to their chemo. Some people don't have support with family like many of us do and also Cancer Council helps with that. There's so many facets to where this money goes I can tell you firsthand it's the best way you can spend your money if you want to support cancer. Barry thank you, you uh, yeah. for your time this morning. Big thanks to Ian and Christine as well and uh, we wish thank everyone you. involved the very best of luck and as uh, Baz was saying there today is the official launch of Cancer Council's biggest morning tea and if you want to get involved get some people together raise money and awareness you've got the rest of May and June to put on an event. It's easy, you can share a cuppa and actually save some lives. And the thing about cancer is it does not care who you are, doesn't care where you live, doesn't care how old you are, how much money you got, it's so indiscriminate. And um, that's why it actually impels every single one Absolutely. of us to get involved. Because research is the key. Indeed. Plenty more to come in this edition of Wake Up, including crossing live to London for an entertainment update, as well as the latest on the Rolf Harris trial, plus an incredible advance in heart transplant technology. And the government's education cuts have enraged students right around the country. So people are asking why the Prime Minister's daughter got a free ride for her higher education. And then after the break, we're going to look at last night's MasterChef.
and the team challenge which bamboozles Sarah and Tash. We'll be back with more of that when we return. You're watching Wake Up right across the country. Coming up on the show, some extraordinary new technology that can put our heart in a box. It's incredible. And keep it pumping. We'll talk to the people behind that. Major, Amazing stuff. Major medical breakthrough. Well, the MasterChef contestants were put to the test in last night's challenge with team captains required to memorise the recipes for not just one, but three courses. Yeah, I can't even remember the shopping list <laughs> when I go to the grocery store. So let's see how Sarah and Tash did trying to remember a very complicated recipe. Five of a mil and popped it into an atmospheric steamer. Oh, God. All right, let's take it from the top again. Yep. I'm just saying, oh, my God, how are we going to remember this? Sorry, what was that? The honey jelly? It's 400. No, it's 100 ml of honey. <laughs> Why can <laughs> we not even remember this? Freeze. I lost my concentration from the beginning. 400 ml. 350 ml of ex <laughs> extra virgin <laughs> olive oil. It's too many beans. We're going to have to go over this again. I know that we're going to be in big trouble. <sighs> oh. I mean, that was pretty tricky. It is very, I don't use recipes. And you haven't, you, your memory is actually excellent for about five seconds. <laughs> I'd like a fish. <laughs> very much the same. Yeah. And don't miss tonight when another of Australia's best home cooks will be eliminated. Now we've got your new sport and weather in just seconds away here on Wake Up. Then coming up after seven o'clock. We will cross to London for the latest from the Rolf Harris trial as a former Channel 7 makeup artist takes the stand. Also, we're going to find out more about this amazing box that is set to revolutionise heart transplants in Australia. Plus, Seth MacFarlane and Charlize Theron sit down with our Maud Garrett to talk about their new Wild Wild West comedy flick. And then a little later on, status updates, photos, check-ins, tags, personal blogs. We're going to ask just how much is too much when it comes to sharing your life online. And thank you so much for your company this morning. As you may know, it's been a really tough couple of days for Network 10, really challenging couple of days. And this is our last week for Wake Up, but we just want to acknowledge all the overwhelming support we have received from you at home. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's plenty of time for sentimentality tomorrow though. So we're gonna storm home with a massive show today. But you're right, the fans, the people who have actually watched the show and uh, shared with us, their thoughts have been really, really wonderful. Speaking of wonderful, this woman has been the bloody light of my life in the last few oh, months, Nora Hafner. I'll save you know my gushing here. for you tomorrow. <laughs> you know what, it's like a story about the animals. You start with the goat and then you work your way up. Not that Nora's a goat, that's not. This is, this is ending horribly. Nola, let's get back to you I've being wonderful. Moose coming up next. So okay. is Tasha Moose? Wow. Yeah. You need to work Not on your gushing, time I've been James. That. <laughs> but I know where you're coming from and right back at you guys. It has been an honour. Mm. But let's uh, start the news with the traffic carnage that's happening here in Melbourne today. There is a situation unfolding on the Monash Freeway here in Melbourne. The freeway has been declared safe now by the bomb squad. But for the latest details, let's now head to Chanel Vella here in Melbourne. Chanel, what time can we expect uh, the freeway to reopen? Good morning, Nola. Well, some good news for drivers heading in on the Monash Freeway this morning is that the freeway will reopen in around about an hour's time. Now, this all unfolded just before five o'clock this morning when it's understood a truck was spotted driving erratically on the wrong side of that freeway, which is a major arterial here in Melbourne's southeast. Witnesses have said that a standoff then occurred between the driver and police and the bomb squad were called in. There were earlier reports that there could have been something suspicious on board that truck but it has now been deemed as safe. Now while that standoff occurred, drivers that were on the freeway at the time were forced to stop their vehicles and get out and move far back down the freeway until that area could be cleared. Now as I said before, that freeway will open in an hour's time which is some good news for drivers but there will be some delays around town this morning. Yeah, a lot of plans have gone haywire this morning, I can tell you that. Thanks, Chanel, for the update. 
A school bus carrying mostly Malaysian students has crashed in Perth after rolling off the road and into a gully just before eight last night in Gijiganap, northeast of the city. 24 people have been taken to hospital, some with broken bones, others with internal injuries. Authorities have been warned about the danger of that stretch of road before, with two small children killed in July last year. An Australian makeup artist has told a London court that Rolf Harris allegedly put his hands up her shorts while they were working on a television recording. The woman, who appeared by video link, claimed the entertainer repeated the action two dozen times while on set. Meantime, the ex-partner of Harris's daughter, Bindi, also told the trial he was told about the alleged abuse on one of her friends during a discussion with the pair. Malcolm Cox said the conversation suggested it was an underage relationship. And straight after the news, Tash and James will cross live to our reporter in London for more on that Rolf Harris trial. Now, a three-year-old boy is still fighting for life in an induced coma after being hit by a car in Sydney's west. The boy was trying to cross a road in Blacktown at around 3pm yesterday outside his family home. He's been left with severe head and internal injuries and it's believed an off-duty nurse performed first aid while paramedics arrived. Of all the states and territories, Brisbane has been hit with the tardy stick, being labelled the worst performing airport in any capital city. For more, we're joined by Jonathan Lee, live now from Brisbane. Jono, how bad are we talking here? Well, in truth, Mueller, it's a poor reputation that's thoroughly deserved. Now, the latest government figures show that last year around 33,000 flights were delayed in and out of Brisbane Airport. Now, when you break this down, we're talking about one in five departures. It's even worse for arrivals, one in three. Now, the chief reason for this at the domestic airport has been the closure of the cross runway. Now, that's been to facilitate a brand new parallel runway, which is being constructed. It's a $1.3 billion project. It's going to be finished by 2020. There's still some time there. If you want to put the finger at the worst performing airline you should look towards tiger if you want to go to the best domestic airport my suggestion is the city of churches Nula. ah go adelaide thanks Jono. jonathan lee there reporting now there are fears more than 118 people have been killed after two car bombs went off in nigeria rescue workers were trying frantically to dig up the rubble of two buildings destroyed in the blast as dozens of people waited to see if their loved ones were okay it's believed most of the victims were women and children. The area is a volatile region dividing the country's Muslim North and Christian South. Hundreds of people have turned out in Canada to see Prince Charles feed a polar bear. Charles and wife Camilla attended an aerospace event before heading straight for the zoo where the polar bear was eagerly awaiting his meal. The prince didn't get too close though, using a massive pair of tongs to pick up the fish. Earlier in the trip, the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall toured a college and senior community centre were also entertained by a choir at the local church. See, he likes theirs too. Taking a look at finance now, up against the greenback, the Aussie dollar's buying 92.33 US cents, 93.66 Japanese yen and 0.67 euros. To sport now and some injury woes for Queensland ahead of Origin Game 1 with Justin Hodges battling an ankle complaint. Meantime, Blues skipper Paul Gallen has initiated a booze-free bonding night in Coffs Harbour where the team's in training camp. And good news for injured knight Alex McKinnon. The Newcastle forward has revealed he's getting feeling back in his legs eight weeks after injuring his spine. Mila Jednak has been named Socceroos skipper for the World Cup, but he may sit out Monday's clash against South Africa. The midfielder's in doubt with a groin injury, meaning vice captains Kim Cahill or Mark Bresciano could be given the armband. Jednak becomes the fourth player to captain Australia at a World Cup. Now, many of our capitals are expecting showers today. Let's see what else is happening weather-wise. A mostly sunny day ahead for Greater Brisbane. Ipswich 25, 24 in Redcliffe and 25 on the Gold Coast. A few showers and 28 for Cairns, Townsville 28 with showers, 26 in Bundaberg with a shower too expected and Brisbane can expect a shower too and a top of 25. Sydney 26 and sunny, Melbourne a few late showers 23, 19 with rain increasing in Hobart. And my animal mania continues from goat to moose. Some good Samaritans have come to the rescue of this little guy who was found wandering along a highway in Canada. The moose was less than a day old when it was found, still wobbly on its legs and a little Aww. dazed and confused. But in true Canadian style, the man and moose made a quick stop off at a local coffee shop 
before heading to an animal refuge. I never thought I'd say this, but I want a moose, a moose around my hoose. How cute is it? Oh. I'm sure they don't get much bigger. I'm sure it'll just stay that size. They're pretty no, dinky yeah. moose, generally. We've heard that before. <laughs> Wait, is the, both those stories from today. Do you think there's enough animal stories for you just to do a pure, cute animal bulletin? <laughs> totes, totes. <laughs> you tune in 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Animal okay. mania. Why Look not? Look forward to it. <laughs> Nola, thank you. We'll Thanks, see you guys. soon. Let's get more now from the Rolf Harris trial in London where overnight an Australian makeup artist has told the jury she was repeatedly groped by the entertainer while working on a television show in 1986. So the court heard that she was manhandled by the now 84 year old more than two dozen times in a single day. Our European correspondent Ben Lewis was in court again. Good morning from here Ben. Yet more uncomfortable details. What else did the makeup artist say in court? Uh, James, good morning. She was pretty blunt when giving her evidence. When asked what she thought of Mr Harris, she said she thought he was a dirty old man. She told the court she'd been hired by Channel 7 in 1986 to do his makeup for a series of television promotions they were shooting over about an eight-hour period. At the start of the day, he's claimed to have been sitting in the chair in the makeup room with his brother, who was also his manager, standing close by. She alleges that his hands started to run up her legs and up inside her denim shorts. As she told the court, my first thought was, oh my God, I can't believe that he works with children. She said that she then went out and applied touch-ups to touch of makeup to his face every so often, but that the alleged abuse continued more than two dozen times. She said, I was upset because I grew up watching Rolf Harris on television, so it was a big surprise someone who was a childhood icon was not what I expected at all. She also told the court that colleagues, when she complained about his alleged behaviour, said they called him the octopus because he was all hands. Such disturbing allegations. Ben, now in cross-examination, Australian actress Tonya Lee, another alleged victim, admits she actually got her dates wrong after an itinerary was presented to her. That's right, Tasha, and this could be crucial to the case. You might remember me explaining yesterday that Tonya Lee claimed that she was indecently assaulted by Mr Harris at a dinner that was at the start of this UK tour she was on with her theatre group back in the mid-80s. Well, today, the defence lawyers presented her with documents to show that that dinner didn't happen at the start of the tour at all. It happened at the end of the tour. She admitted that she probably got the dates wrong. She said she's not a robot, she's not perfect, and that it was some time ago. Why it's so important is she has claimed that after the alleged abuse for the rest of the tour, she couldn't eat, that she lost kilos, she got an eating disorder and started getting really sick. The defence is saying, how can that possibly be the case if this alleged incident only occurred a couple of days, or a few days rather, before she left the country? We also heard from Malcolm Cox, who has a son with Harris's daughter, Bindi. What did he have to say? Well, he said that he was informed of the alleged abuse of Bindi's best friend, uh, that it was discussed one night when they were actually staying at Rolf Harris's house. And he was, he was quite emotional when he gave his evidence. He said that he didn't want the entertainer to be around his own grandson anymore. He said they used to carry a photograph of his son uh, and Rolf in the top pocket of his jacket. But since finding out about these allegations, he ripped it in half to get rid of the side of Rolf. Although he did admit that he is no fan of the Harris family at all. Ben, thanks for joining us this morning. And now to another political headache for the Prime Minister. With revelations, his daughter, Frances, was awarded a $60,000 scholarship to attend a design school where the chairman of the board was a generous donor to her father's campaign. The controversy comes right when students and faculty all over the country are vigorously protesting the government's planned education cuts for everyday Australians. To talk to us about the latest, Argy Bargy, our good mate, the political editor of the Adelaide Advertiser, Tori Shepherd joins us again this morning. Good morning, Tori. I mean, people get scholarships all the time, all across the country. Why is this such a big deal? It's such a big deal, partly because of the timing. As you just heard, people were protesting because they're going to have to pay more for their uni degrees. So people who can't afford it, they're going to have to fork out 100 grand to go to uni. And meanwhile, the daughter of the Prime Minister gets this scholarship, which was worth about 60 grand. Uh, according to one report I read, she paid around seven grand. 
But the sort of smell is around how she was awarded the scholarship because it doesn't sound like there's a regular application process where everyone puts in their uh, portfolio, their design portfolio, and then, you know, the best best person gets picked. It sounds a little more arbitrary than that, that the, that the chairman uh, pretty much just awarded it straight to Frances Abbott. Uh, and, you know, for all we know, she's absolutely the best design student who was around at that time. It just looks like a normal kind of process wasn't really followed and that the people at the Institute are actually close friends of Mr Abbott's donors to the Liberal Party and have presented him with gifts in the past so there's a strong relationship there then there's the kind of lack of a normal application process for the scholarship then there's the timing along with all the increases to uni fees and it, it just doesn't quite pass the pub test even though it may be that nothing particularly wrong was done. So Tori is this something the Prime Minister should have declared then? Well, possibly. The, uh, the declaration rules are a little bit tricky and scholarships aren't really mentioned in there. So you have to declare gifts, for example. Uh, you have to make it clear if there are things that are happening that might be a potential conflict of interest. And that kind of phrasing, you know, is there a potential conflict of interest, that's, that's fairly vague. So look, at first I think everyone was saying, no, he didn't need to have declared this. But then there's also another, um, another article this morning saying that Actually, because there is a potential appearance of a conflict of interest, he probably could have. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff that gets declared, you know, free tickets for his daughters to the movies and so on and so forth. That all gets listed so that it's transparent and everyone knows what's going on. And this just wasn't. Maybe it should have been. Tori, in isolation, this probably wouldn't be talked about very much, but it seems on the back of those protests, on the back of the heat they've got from the budget, the little wink incident yesterday, it feels like the narrative is starting to turn against the government in many quarters. Are you seeing that amongst other writers, other journalists across the board? Oh, absolutely. And look, a similar thing happened with the uh, the Labor government. Once things start to turn sour, everyone sees every little incident as sort of more evidence mm. of a government walking down the wrong path. So you're right. Look, the wink in isolation would have been maybe a flurry on social media, but that also came after, you know, Joe Hockey and Matthias Cormann smoking cigars. It came after the news that, you know, Joe Hockey had a little dance in his office after the budget. It does feed into this narrative of, a, I guess, a callous government that you know is is enjoying itself while a lot of people are actually in a lot of anxiety and pain over some pretty harsh budget cuts. Tori I've just been looking online the speculation has already started today about uh, the Prime Minister under pressure and you know talking of leadership change is that something that might happen right now the government's under a lot of pressure Look, they are under a lot of pressure, but they've got some time to wait it out. So, uh, you know, everyone loves loves talking about leadership, and I think after all the drama of last year, it pretty quickly comes to the tip of people's tongue. I don't, th I don't think anything will happen too soon. I mean, they don't really have to worry about it uh, for another sort of two, more than two years. Uh, there is still this sort of oddly lingering threat of a double dissolution if they can't mm. get their budget cuts through <laughs> through the Senate. So, look, there's a there's a long shot that something fairly dramatic it could happen there but I'd say chances are they're going to try and wait it out They've, they do have the luxury of a little bit of time which the Labor government didn't have last year when the when the leadership spills there were going on yeah I think wherever people stand they'd just like to see one person in charge for you know more than 18 months that'd be nice Tori thanks for the update wouldn't we'll it be nice chat to you again <laughs> soon well, we've just got a quick update now on the situation on the Monash freeway that Nola mentioned earlier in this morning's news. It has now reopened and traffic is moving in both directions. A 35-year-old man has been arrested after a brief standoff with police early this morning. The bomb squad was called in, but the freeway was deemed safe a short time ago. So good news for those heading into the Melbourne at CBD this morning. Let's move on to a wonderful medical breakthrough. We're fascinated by this story, but we do warn you, this story contains some pretty graphic images of surgery, but we've deemed them necessary. A beating heart in a box. Sounds like something out of Star Trek or from the future, but thanks to new technology, it's actually a reality in our hospitals now, and it's set to save lives. Time has always been the enemy of transplant surgeons because organs deteriorate so quickly once out of the body. But now donor hearts can actually be kept alive in a special box, still beating until they're given to the new patient. 
and heart transplant surgeon Professor Kamud Detal joins us now from St Vincent's Hospital where the device is being used. Good morning, doctor. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. Can you tell us exactly how this technology works? Okay, um, this technology is essentially a portable device. It is a box on wheels which contains a sterile disposable unit, a one-time use where the actual organ sits, in this case the heart, and there is circuitry within that uh, device which allows the heart to be filled and perfused with blood and other nutrient solutions and oxygen so that of course the heart then beats. As long as you provide it with the uh, right amount of blood, it will beat and then we can then test its function. It's warm, uh, we can change the temperature, which allows us to avoid the really uh, detrimental effects of ischemia, which is the lack of this oxygen and nutrients in the blood when it is carried in the traditional fashion of it being packed in ice and brought in an esky. And that means we can go further afield to procure hearts uh, from donors and also to try and resuscitate those hearts that are not functioning well. Yeah, it is extraordinary compared to what you're talking about used to be used, the idea of a heart in an, ex in an esky. How long does this mean you can keep a heart beating for? Okay, I mean the longest it has been on clinically and with a successful transplant has been uh, around eight hours. We here in St Vincent's have certainly used it beyond four hours with very good results. In experimental animal work, they've done it for a lot longer, over 12 hours without detriment. So, Doctor, what will this mean for heart transplant patients? How much of a breakthrough is it? Well, it's an enormous breakthrough because, as you know, a lot of the hearts that are donated um, are, under, are not utilised for one reason or another, either because there has been an actual heart disease that would preclude the use, but more importantly, a lot of the hearts that we reject are actually good hearts that either because of the brain death and consequences of it, or for other reason, are not temporarily working well and these hearts get rejected and now it means we can go and assess these hearts and potentially resuscitate them on this device and use them and recently we have had four very successful stories here at St Vincent's with people literally at the last stages of their heart disease who have now benefited with a transplant and are doing exceptionally well afterwards. Now we're just looking at some of that vision there it is mm. amazing to look at do you ever not feel fascinated or intrigued by just how incredible that organ is, the human heart? It is. I mean, it's fascinating, but on the other hand, that's all it knows how to do. Yeah. You provide mm. it with enough blood and it'll just beat as long as it's normal. Yeah, we're, uh, we're absolutely entranced by it here and um, we, we wish you all the best. Just quickly, is the technology you're using for this, is that the sort of thing that you could use for other organs of the body? Absolutely. So we here are using it for hearts and lungs. And um, around the world, there are different types of machines that are serving livers and kidneys. Um, and this particular device we have will also have a liver uh, uh, a module that's coming shortly. Professor, such incredible, you know, incredible news. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know what? I love doctors and I love researchers and I love nurses. I just think we have such extraordinary Australians in this country. And every time you go into a hospital, you just think every day these guys are saving lives. It yeah. is so exciting. We have, you know, some of the best researchers and doctors and specialists in the world. Mm. And you know why they do it? Because they want to make a difference. I know. So, they want to save lives. Yeah. And that is truly extraordinary. That, that is your driving motivation when you go into your workplace. So good on them. A change of pace now and let's get the entertainment news and there's some exciting news for fans of the Eagles. Talking to you Tom. Yeah, this morning <laughs> they've made an announcement and our entertainment reporter slash music guru slash male model Kevin Hughes joins us now <laughs> with all the details. Kevin, this is big. <laughs> This is big. Uh, guys, early this week, we talked about uh, Queen, of course, returning to Australia for the first time in 30 years. Well, now the Eagles are set to return. They'll play Australia. They'll play New Zealand for the first time in 20 years in February, March 2015. Those lush harmonies, those rock classics, Hotel California. It's the history of the Eagles tour, guys. It's a mammoth show, multimedia presentation, all the big hits, three-hour show. Don Henley, Glenn Fry and the boys are back on the road, and it will be a must. See show. So go check out the Eagles, check into Hotel California. I can't yeah. believe I said that, but I did. <laughs> March 2015. Awesome. Now, Kevin, other entertainment news today. It would seem that uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelina Jolie have opposing views when it comes to motherhood. What's this about? 
Yes, Angelina Jolie is obviously currently promoting her new Disney film, the remake of Sleeping Beauty, Maleficent. She's told the Daily News magazine in the States that she has nothing to complain about when it comes to being a working mother and a mother raising her children. She says she knows and respects the fact that she's in a very fortunate position where she's able to take her six children on the road. She's able to school them as the, her and Brad, of course, tour the world, uh, either on film sets or promoting their movies or wherever they go, the Middle East, Asia, war zone. She says she understands her privileged position but doesn't take it for granted. And she says her heart goes out to working mothers. Mm -hmm. They are the people who are really fighting and up against it, as it were. So good on her for saying that. Really honest stuff. Yeah, it puts it into a bit of perspective, I think. Yeah. And finally, a bit of baby news for a star from The O.C., a show mm. which Tash loved. Oh, Who is it, Kev? Love it. <laughs> uh, well, good news for Rachel Bilson. She oh, is yes. uh, pregnant. She's pregnant with her first child, Hayden Christensen. Uh, Hayden Christensen, of course, uh, will be that big daddy. And uh, the couple have announced that, yes, they will expect their first child uh, later this year. Of course, they uh, first got hitched on the set of Jumper, that fine movie, in 2007. Uh, got married uh, two years later. Had a rocky period, back together. But the good news is, yeah, Rachel Bilson is pregnant. Aw, bless. Now, Kev, I know this um, story just completely excites you. Melts his heart. <laughs> the Kim Ye yes. wedding guest list has been revealed and a key family member is missing. What are the details? Big story, guys. Breaking news. It's all about the big wedding this weekend. All eyes on Paris, on Florence. We now know that <coughs> Bruce Jenner's son, Brody Jenner, of course, Star of the Hills, will not be attending the ceremony. I know you're gutted to hear this, but apparently it's because his uh, girlfriend of the last seven months, Caitlin Carter, Carter, has not been invited. In fact, many of the guests and selected family members have not had plus ones to the wedding. He didn't get a plus one. It looks like Brody Jenner will not be stepping oh. on that plane, but uh, Bruce will be there. All eyes are set on Europe for the big ceremony this weekend. The guys were sp uh, spotted in Paris today shopping with Valentino bags being shipped back to the hotel. Well, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, sure, they can get no. one more invite there. The guy just wants <laughs> to take his girlfriend. Yeah, they're doing it tough, I think, financially. They are, and actually, yeah. they're putting um, yeah. four spots for the wedding on Gumtree. We've just heard that should come in. <laughs> Kev, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so I'm much. I'm signing up. Thanks, nice, guys. Well, thanks for watching Wake Up This Morning. It's our second last show, and we're very happy that you've joined us this morning. Still to come today, Norla will have your latest news, sport and weather, and later we'll look at how your privacy can be violated online and in daily life. Plus, Seth MacFarlane brings his unique style of humour to the wild, wild west, and it's very, very funny. And we speak to the author of Toxin, Tox Out, who says there are dangerous poisons lurking in everything around us. Interesting. Very interesting. Thanks to Inner Health Plus. Have you had your Inner Health Plus today? Wake up. We'll be back in a tick.